Welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite, a show that will help you transform your marketing from mere messaging to programs that break the rules and make a difference. Join the movement today and learn non-traditional techniques that give you an edge. Now, here's your chief marketing renegade, Drew Neiser. I have a particularly sweet guest today um, whose name is Rich Honeyball, who is the CMO of the Navy Exchange, also known as Nexcom. Welcome, Rich. Hi, Drew. How are you today? I am fantastic. I'm really excited. By the way, congratulations on your CMO Club Award. Uh, that's a wonderful recognition for your uh, innovative uh, work at, at Nextcom. Can you just start with give us a little background on what prepared you uh, in, in your career to be the, uh, for this particular job? Well, that's actually been one of the toughest questions I've ever had to answer is that 30-second elevator speech that defines who I am. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of cool things throughout my career. They've all, they all have evolved around the customer branding and the customer experience, but I've had the opportunity to do it from a merchandising, a product development and design, a brand development, a marketing and e-commerce, a digital and customer experience perspective. So... Currently, I'm the Chief Merchandising and Marketing Officer for the Navy Exchange. Um, I ran a brand marketing agency uh, back in Dallas. Before that, I was the head of marketing for um, Hager and also ran e-commerce and licensing strategy and was the VP of Product Development and Design for the Men's and Kids Private Labels at JCPenney. Um, so I've, I've been fortunate enough that I've done enough different things and had some great mentors along the way that has put me in the position that I'm in today. Yeah, it seems like you've got a really strong uh, retail background, uh, which obviously this f job feels like. Um, and also interesting that you have an agency background, which makes you automatically uh, uh, more creative in my book, uh, given the, the challenges of being on the agency side. But we'll leave that for another time. Um, I am... One thing that is interesting is your title includes merchandising, and that's not... Uh, that's quite unusual, actually. Uh, in, typically, the marketing is over here and the merchandising is over here. Does that really, I would imagine that would really help you uh, in a retail job like this? It, it, it does. And having been in, the, you know, when you're in the merchandising role, you, you think you're doing everything right and you question the marketing. I think when you're in a marketing role, you look over at merchandising and say, if only, um, now having responsibility for both, it uh, there, there is benefit, absolutely, and it's it's an amazing job. Um, but you realize how challenging both are, um, and how symbiotic they have to work together in order to achieve success. Yeah, and I would think also the constraints on your time would be uh, intense. So I really appreciate you taking the time to be on on this show. Um, let's just, uh, given that time must be a big issue for you, let, let's have some fun and and tell me what your your superpower is. Well, you know, I asked my I asked my daughter that, and, and she's a fan of the Flash. So she said, if you had super speed, you could get your projects done really quick and get home. Um, it, it, you know, thinking about it, and it would be a dangerous power to have. I wish I had the ability to go back in time, and it would have to be controlled so that I couldn't go back and change something really dynamic. But you know, when you've put together a certain ad or or a certain campaign, and you'd like to make that little tweak, and you'd like to see what it would do. Um, or you maybe said the wrong thing to someone and you wanted to correct it. I'd love to have the ability to go back in time. Oh, baby, yeah, me too. <laughs> Particularly the one on saying the wrong thing at the right time. Uh, uh -huh. but, uh, uh, yes, well, I, I appreciate that. All right, well, so if you had to choose between Batman and Superman, who would you, uh, who would you pick? Oh, I'm a Batman all the way. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I understand that, although that x-ray vision would be pretty cool. All right. Well, let's get serious here and talk about um, what's, what is the Navy Exchange for those folks who don't know what it is? So I'll go backwards to go forward. Um, the, the Navy Exchange started in, in 1946 as an official organization, but before that, imagine you're a sailor. You're, you're stationed on a ship. You're somewhere in a remote area. Um, and the things that you or I would go to a local convenience store, local shop to get, um, you know, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, soda, chips, candy bars, um, magazines or whatever, um, 
you don't have access to on a ship. So you would have uh, enter, you'd have entrepreneurs that would come out to the ships on what were called bum boats, or like a flat bottom boat, and they would sell their wares to the sailors. Well, at one point, the ships decided, you know, if we open up a ship store, what we can do is we can make sure the product that's being sold is of the highest quality, because it wasn't always if it was on a bum boat. Um, we can buy it cheaper. We can sell it to the sailor cheaper and save them money. And whatever revenue we do make, we can put aside in a morale and welfare fund so that we can do fun things for the crew and for their family when we get back to shore. Um, if you take that, that's in essence what our mission continues today. Um, we still have, uh, there are still stores w within the ships, um, but we are right now a $2 billion retail organization with stores all over the world that range anywhere from a 200 square foot micro mart which is a 24 seven vending operation to a 200,000 square foot flagship store that looks like a department store attached to an electronic store, attached to a home store, attached to a drug store. Wow. And everything in between. And our mission is the same as it was back in 1946 is to provide um, quality goods and services at a, uh, at a, at a savings for our military members, their families and retirees. Um, it's to give them access to those products all over the world. We just opened up a new store in Djibouti in the Horn of Africa. Um, and it is to take the revenue that we earn. We contribute 70% of it back to morale, welfare, and recreation, which is a department of the Navy. Um, every military branch has one. And they're the organization that builds the, uh, the bowling alleys and the movie theaters and the gyms and the parks and, and child care centers. And then the other 30% of our revenue goes back into enhancing our customer experience, improving our stores, and really building a stronger quality of life for our customers. Wow. And, and that's a really interesting and unique uh, business model. But when you talk about $2 billion and uh, 300 plus stores with such a variety, it must create some complex marketing challenges. So I'm curious, you have a, a finite audience uh, for the most part. Uh, and how? Let's talk about, uh, about a specific marketing initiative you had in uh, uh, in the last year that you're particularly proud of. So it's interesting, and, and actually, the 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 in in talking through it, a lot of what we do is obviously product marketing and, and promotion. But one of the things that I'm um, I'm proud of our team for executing this year is is how we executed our 70th anniversary. Um, we celebrated 70 years in, in April. Uh, and we, um, in addition to the things that you normally do when you celebrate an anniversary, which is exclusive product and promotions and fun events, we use it as an opportunity to really have an engaging dialogue, a two-way dialogue with our associates and our customers. And we launched a social campaign called Love My Next, and we asked customers and associates how the Next has had a positive impact on their lives. Um, whenever you do those campaigns, and, and this was something done through email and digital and social and through our traditional marketing, you, you prime the pump and you hope that you're going to get a response and you, you prepare for if you don't get that much of a response. The response we, we had was overwhelming. Um, customers and associates feeding us stories on um, how the Nexus had an impact in their lives 30 years ago, 20 years ago, or even yesterday. And it really, from a brand perspective, is fantastic because sometimes you work for a brand that has to go back to the 1930s or 40s to find that special thing that they did. Um, as a brand and as an organization, we can reach back to yesterday and find that we've done something really impactful for our customers. So that campaign has spurred on other things that we've done throughout the year. But it was just something that was it, it was energizing for the organization, and really, it was a great conversation with our customers. That's really that's really cool and really interesting. And and we're going to take a quick break. But when I come back, I'm going to uh, dive into this uh, this user generated content program that Rich was talking about, and and sort of get into some of the details that helped it uh, really work effectively. Renegade Thinkers Unite is brought to you by Social Media Explorer, the website that explores the world of social media from the inside out. Great advice from today's leading social media columnists and experts at socialmediaexplorer.com. That's socialmediaexplorer.com. Okay, we're back with Rich Honeyball of the Next 
Next, uh, Nextcom, otherwise known as the Navy Exchange, or Next, uh, or just Next, I guess, to its uh, to your customers. So, talk a little bit about how this user-generated content campaign uh, actually played out, and how you were able to use some of that content, how you gathered it, and how you, how you used it. Well, I'll, I'll start. I'll go back a step. Um, one of the unique things about uh, about the Navy Exchange, about Nextcom, is the fact that a third of our associates over a third of our associates either served in the military or they have family members who are serving or have served. Um, in fact, my boss, I report to the CEO who's a retired admiral. Um, and so there's already this deep connection with our customer throughout our organization. So it really starts with the, the team. This is a, um, a campaign that the team put together and it was something that they're deeply rooted in. So it, it already had momentum before it even got to our customers. It was a conversation that our associates were already having around the 70th anniversary. Um, at that point, it was really engaging with our customers and, and giving up some of the traditional space that we would have in marketing for promotions and using that to, um, you know, to, to start to weave the narrative together, to, to encourage customers to tell us the stories and then following that through um, through social media, primarily Facebook, but other other um, channels as well, um, and just encourage customers to send us their photos, give us um, the the stories of of when they were stationed overseas or or working for the next or or how the next has benefited them, um, and and it really it it went viral very quickly because it was a conversation that people wanted to have. Um, one of the things that it pulled from is. A couple months later, we have a um, what we call a DMM, a divisional merchandise manager that handles our essentials business that um, came up with a, an event called Next Cares. Um, you or I travel for business. We're gone for a week or two. Um, we, we miss our families. We, we miss our friends. The, the person in the military who is deployed is gone, is away from their family for six, seven, eight months. Um, I, I have a hard time even imagining that because I didn't have the privilege of serving. Um, if you think about one of that, one of the touch points with your family, it's that care package that you get from home. So off of the 70th anniversary, she created Next Cares with the help of our vendors and our associates and our marketing and merchandising team and our store teams. And it was inviting kids under the age of 12 to come in at no charge to them. They would get a gift certificate. They would get packing supplies, boxes, materials, and they would go through stations and put together this care package for a deployed family member. They would, at the same time, there was a, um, there was story time and there were kids characters and there was dress up and pictures being taken. And then when they were done, they would seal the box, color all over it, hand it to someone who would put it on a truck and they would deliver it. And I watched one, um, young woman, eight years old, who went through the entire station, handed the box to the driver and said, can you get this to my daddy on the USS Barry? And when you have that kind of community connection, and you allow customers the opportunity to talk about it, it just takes on a momentum of its own. And you, you end up getting customers and associates and people that are just standing around in awe of it. And it, it, it's almost something that you, you have to allow the stage for. Um, but if it's really meaningful, it takes on a life of its own. Yeah, and you know, I, I think you really touch on on so many issues that that I think are are relevant to other marketers. And I, I noticed a, in a in a question that you answered uh, to me earlier in writing, you talked about finding this balance uh, between sort of data management and you know optimizing and using ideas and actually uh, touching people on an emotional level. And it, it sounds like you really were able to tap into the emotional connection that that your target has with, you know, the service, I, I mean, with, with, with being in the Navy and, and really we're able to connect to that, uh, which is, is a phenomenal. And one of the things that, that, you know, I learned coming into this organization and working with um, the incredibly talented team that I have the opportunity to work with is, um, you know, how much the, the, the next is, is part of their lives, especially when you're stationed overseas. Um, and to the, to the extent that when, when we ran an event, uh, we had, you know, every, our locations are all attached to a, to a base um, or a facility of some sort. And when we ran one of our first Next Cares events, um, the base commanding officer, who in, is in essence the mayor of the base, if you will, 
um, was at the event, um, talking to family members. It was his opportunity to connect with them as well. Um, his wife had flown back on the red eye the night before to be there for the event. Uh, the base uh, command master chief, which is the senior enlisted uh, person on the base, was there for almost the entire event. It's kind of like being Walmart or Target and having the mayor of the town at your events. That's, that's and not just for a grand opening, but for something you did on a Saturday. And and that connection is, is really rich and something that it's really fun to build on. And, you know, I want to make sure that as we talk about this, we think in terms of, so this is, this is a unique business and business model. And, but I suspect that many of the principles that you've learned from other jobs, which, which are less, you know, that are more sort of traditional retail uh, apply. But I also suspect that you're doing some things that brands could learn from. And, and I think let's, let's just talk about, even though you have this unique situation where you have a very specific target and I would argue a finite target um, who knows your brand and has an ongoing relationship with them, at least while they're in the service, um, what kinds of things have you learned from this experience uh, that you would share with your, your fellow CMOs that, that could be applicable to other retail uh, scenarios? It's an interesting question, Drew, and, and one I would say, you know, in some ways it is a unique retailing experience. In many ways, it's it's retail at its purest. Um, you know, if you, if you go into a Navy exchange, you will find that we carry the, the same brands and the same products that you would find at, at many different stores. We just carry a wider range because we uh, appeal to such a wide range of customers that are just connected through their military service. Um, but many of the same things that I experienced in, in retail throughout my career are appropriate here. The customer's looking for, you know, a great value. They're looking for product quality. They're looking for a product that offers the solution. Um, in retail today, you've got, you have customers that are buying less of certain categories and they're investing more into personal experiences. They're investing in their home. Those are the same trends that we see in our retail organization here, and they're the same trends that we have to respond to. Um, and on the one hand, we have this this connection with our customer because we're part of um, we're part of the military community. But in many ways, we don't have the same availability to just ping our customers. They have to opt into our marketing. Um, we we have to encourage them to come into a store. We have to be there for them. It isn't just an automatic that they're going to shop at the at the Navy Exchange. Um, because of the amount of competition and the ease of competition that's out there. So we have to work as hard as any other retailer in order to deliver the quality and the value and the service that they would expect anywhere. I mean, I would imagine that, you know, Amazon must be a, a competitor is, is certainly a convenience. If you, um, do you also offer uh, e-commerce uh, as a, as to your customers? We do. We have um, we have an e-commerce site. Um, it continues to grow. We're actually doing very well. Um, we have uh, a lot of our orders that are that are shipped to store, picked up in store, um, because of the the um, the ability for customers to be able to mix the the bricks and mortar experience with the web experience. And and I think we're doing that much more intimately today. And and we'll continue to refine that omni-channel or that that customer journey experience. Um, it, it is. Uh, there, you know, we, you, you, we compete with every retailer that's out there. Every time that someone has an option to buy something from someplace else, um, they, they are a competitor. The, the difference is that we try to be better at anticipating and serving their needs and ensuring that we deliver as, as strong a value as possible. The, the other thing is that value, and, and I think this is true for our customer and it's true for all customers, value isn't just the price that you pay. It's the, um, it, you know, it, it's not just the price of the discount you get. It's uh, what, what was the service level? Um, what's the commitment to quality? What's the return policy if something goes wrong? Does someone stand behind it? It's was it convenient? Was it a fun shopping experience? All of those things go into the value equation, and it's a little bit different for each customer. And we have to be malleable enough to be able to make sure that whatever the customer is expecting from us, we can deliver better than our competitors. Renegade Thinkers Unite is brought to you by Social Media Explorer, the website that explores the world of social media from the inside out. Great advice from today's leading social media columnists and experts at socialmediaexplorer.com. That's socialmediaexplorer.com.
that's a very high bar, and uh, it also must create some very complicated uh, measurement uh, challenges because you're talking about both sort of particularly when we look at retail because we could talk about the cash register, right, and just sales, but, you know, did you sell to the right person? Were they happy with the experience? All those things. Do you have metrics that sort of get at brand health versus, say, transactional metrics? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and it's, you know, it is – we we have a you know we have a sailor first mentality is one of the first conversations that i had with with my boss coming into the organization is you know sailor first profit second but the sailor depends on our profit so make sure we hit that metric so it's it, it's intertwined um we just we we will we we don't ever do anything um forsaking our customer for the sake of profit and and i think we we operate it at that high bar in terms of metrics beyond just sales um you know, we we're looking at um, uh, the customer experience. We're looking at brand health, brand satisfaction. Um, we use 4C. We we're, we're out there measuring on a on a daily and a weekly basis what the customer is saying. Um, we're we're paying attention to um, uh, to social media. Facebook for us has been. Um, you know, if I go back a year ago, a lot of our posts on social were more commerce related. Um, probably 80% commercial posts or or um, promotional posts and 20% real good kind of uh, connecting content. Um, today it's flipped. And we use Facebook as an avenue for our customers to give us feedback, um, both positive and constructive that we can respond to either uh, publicly or privately. So that's been a great way to connect with our customers. We have a 24-7 call center right here in Virginia um, that we use for both our uniform program because we manage the sales of that as well as for our, our regular retail. So we still talk to customers by phone, by email. Um, it's, it's, a, it's very rich, and we're always evaluating it, and we're giving feedback to the appropriate department and continually trying to improve and enhance the experience. Yeah, it seems like uh, you, you uh, are covering uh, certainly a lot of the bases of, of, of you know, brand management uh, on a retail level. And I, I think your observation and use of Facebook is, is certainly enlightened, uh, you know, starting with social as a social channel versus a commerce channel is, is, is you know, that's certainly what, uh, what the customer has in mind. So I'm, I'm curious as if we sort of bring this to a head and, and, focus just for a second on some of the biggest lessons that uh, you've learned in the last year uh, that uh, you might want to share with the, with, with, with the audience. I think the biggest lesson is something that um, I, I think you know inherently, I know inherently, uh, I think most retailers and, and most marketers know inherently, but it, I, I think we constantly have to remind ourselves about it is it, you know, whether we're chasing a new technology or a new metric or new analytics or a new product or, or whatever it happens to be, it, it begins and it ends with the customer. Um, it begins and ends with, uh, does it add value? Does it make a difference in their lives? Um, does it have a meaningful impact? Can we communicate it? Do they want it? Um, and I think that's the question that, that we come back to. Um, I'm, I'm proud to be part of an organization that puts its, its customers at the forefront. Um, I think a lot of my marketing peers would agree that, that, they, that they do that. Um, I think whenever we're looking at the technology or the products or a way to enhance the business, if we don't stop for a second and say, is this going to make life better for the customer? Um, and we don't take that pause, I think we can, we can run ourselves aground. And, and I think that's the biggest um, I, I won't call it an aha. Um, I think it's a, um, I just think it's that, that, that common metric that we have to look at. The, the other thing, and, and I'll use it from an innovative perspective, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and there were a couple of speakers that really stood out for me. Um, one was um, from a trend reporting company and was really a futurist, and one of the slides was a self-driving car, and it showed a a couple that you know wasn't paying attention to the road. They were scanning data, uh, looking or scanning the the internet, looking for where they were going to shop or where they were going to eat. And we talked about you know the day five or ten years from now where you have self driving cars that drive themselves to the grocery store to pick up groceries that your fridge has ordered for you. Um, and and it's just you know real you know seemingly out there stuff that's probably going to happen in the next few years. And that kind of innovation is fun. 
but there was a second speaker that struck me even more. And she was a second lieutenant in the army. Um, she was an athlete. Um, she was in Iraq and she lost her leg in an explosion in a Humvee and innovation for her started in a split second. It was innovating the way that she walked, the way that she trained, the way that she thought of herself, the way that she carried herself, the way that she reconnected with athletics. Um, and she became a, a Paralympic athlete, um, a medal winner for the United States. She's done marathons. She's done Ironman triathlons. And it was, it was innovative, but it was situational innovation based on a need that happened in that split second. And, and that's also a lesson learned that we can talk about the things that we have uh, the opportunity to do two or three years from now, but what do we have to do based on today, based on the tools and resources that we have to satisfy the customer's needs? And, and that's a good learning for, for me this year is how we can be situationally innovative today and not wait for what's going to happen tomorrow. That's such a great place to uh, wrap up. It's such an inspiring story and reminds us that uh, we humans uh, tend to make uh, emotional decisions as opposed to rational ones. Often uh, these things are, are, are based in circumstances that may be beyond our control. But you know, ultimately, the brand decision comes down to, I don't know, I just like them better. And, and certainly all of the efforts that you have, uh, have done uh, to, uh, to stay close to your customers certainly must help uh, uh, to get your, your customers to say, yeah, you know, I just, I just feel good about shopping there. And, and that, that becomes less about, as you said, less about price and, and more about uh, loyalty, which has got to be about the hardest thing to foster in any brand. So to that, I salute you, which I, I suspect is uh, appropriate given uh, Navy Exchange's uh, terminology. And I would uh, just want to thank you for, for being on the show, which is really, really enlightening. Thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. This has been Renegade Thinkers Unite, but it doesn't end there. Just go to RenegadeThinkersUnite.com for more and subscribe to the show. That way, you'll never miss an episode. We'll talk with you next time on Renegade Thinkers Unite.